Amen. Thank you, Miss Kay. That's a song I listened to my mother sing all my life. But it wasn't until I got older that I understood and began to pray to the Lord, whatever it takes to make me more like you. And there are days I take it back. <laughs> I was like, Lord, I was just kidding. <laughs> it's getting serious. But you know what? If I'm going to walk with him, it comes back to the Lord, whatever it takes. Whatever you've got to do in me to make me like Jesus, then you keep doing it. Get this out of the way or I'll hurt myself. Well, I have to tell you, I've never heard my name called in one meeting so many times in all my life. I do want to say this to you. For the last year and a half, it has been a pleasure to be your music minister. For the last six weeks, it's been a pleasure to be your acting pastor. And in whatever way God chooses to use me from this day forward, it'll be a pleasure to be a part of First Baptist Church, McAllen, Texas. Amen. <laughs> because one thing I want you to understand, I, I said this to anybody who has asked me over the last few weeks about this particular subject, I'm not politicking for a position. I'm not looking for a job. I want to do what God wants me to do. And when that God makes that abundantly clear, when his calling comes, because I want to tell you, you're not hiring a CEO, you're calling a man of God to be a pastor. And when that calling comes, then that's what you need to do. All right, and if that's me, I'll do it, praise the Lord. If it's not me, I'll do whatever else God says to do. All right, so just understand that tonight. I love you. I love this church. I have come to deeply love living and being a part of this church in McAllen, Texas. And however God chooses to use us in the future, we're just going to be obedient and do what he wants. That's all I care about. Second Chronicles chapter 16, we're going to finish up tonight looking at the life of Asa. We've been studying over the last several weeks about seeking God in worship, seeking God for his wisdom, seeking God for his way, seeking God in war, and then this morning we looked at seeking God without fail, without fail. We talked about that in the latter days of Asa's life, something happened to him to where he quit trusting God, quit focusing on the Lord, quit having faith to walk with God moment by moment and begin concerned about himself and begin focusing on his position and he didn't want to lose his position and his power. So instead of seeking God, he saw somebody he thought could fix the situation for him. And I want us to look tonight, we're going to finish up the last two points that I wanted to, wanted to talk about and then we're going to compare victory and defeat. Because even though in 2 Chronicles 16 his plan worked, he was defeated. Even though he, he did exactly what he thought was clever and what he thought he should do, he didn't seek God. He just did what he thought was right or what he thought was clever. And it worked, but God didn't bless it. God's hand wasn't on him. So we talked about through the chapter 16, especially how the prophet came to speak to him and said, wasn't God able to save you from the Ethiopians? I mean, when this massive army came against you, wasn't he able to save you? And didn't he miraculously give you the victory? So why was it that now, when the king of Israel comes before you, you couldn't trust God? You couldn't seek God? Well, as it happened, I mean, the prophet had some pretty tough things to say. I, I was thinking about when I believe it was Nathaniel came to David. Was it Nathaniel? I didn't read up on that story. I just remember it from memory. It, wasn't, it was a prophet that came to David and said, Nathan. That was close. It was close. <laughs> he came to David and said, what would you think about a man who had all these sheep and when he wanted to, to throw a party, instead of killing one of his multitude in the flock, he went to his neighbor who only had one that he loved. And he took his neighbors and killed them. He said, what would you think about a man like that? And David said, he was enraged. He said, show me that man. I'll deal with him. And Nathan said, you are that man. You are that man. Now, the difference between Nathan and Asa is Nathan had a heart after God 
and he repented. Nathan made horrible, I mean, David made horrible mistakes, but he repented. Every time God showed him the truth, he repented. But we're going to see here in Asa's life, there's something about the truth he doesn't want to know. And when the prophet says to him, especially when he gets down to the very last thing, he said, you, Asa, have done a foolish thing. You have done a foolish thing, and from now on you will be at war. Now, you know, anytime we're confronted with truth, we have to make a decision on it. When I read the Word of God in the mornings when I study and I seek the Lord and I read the Word of God and God pierces my heart, a verse of Scripture touches me and God and the Holy Spirit inside of me says, that's you, I have a choice to make. I can say, yes, Lord, that's correct. I confess it. Uh, Confession just simply means I'm agreeing with God. Or I can say, no, that can't be true. That can't be right. The problem is, when you see truth, you're responsible. You can't unsee it. Oh, how many times I have wished in my life I could take back what I just saw when it comes to the Word, because God pierces my heart. But you know what? I'm glad I never did. But Asa, he made a decision. Verse 10 says, Asa was angry with the seer because of this. He was angry. When the truth of God was presented to him, he didn't say, you're right. I acted wrong. I I, I shouldn't have done that. He didn't repent. He didn't believe it. He didn't believe what the prophet had just said was true. He didn't want to face the truth. And so he, he became angry with the seer, and he was enraged that he put him in prison. Now, that's getting mad at the truth right there. Faced with facts, faced with truth, he didn't want to accept it. He got angry. And Asa ended his life refusing to seek after God. God had done so much for him. Asa had walked with God for many years, but his life ended with him not even seeking God. The Bible says in the last part of chapter 16 from verses 11 through verses 13, that though the disease, in verse 12, though the disease was severe, even in his illness, he did not seek help from the Lord, but only from the doctors. It's not how you start. It's how you finish. And Asa did not finish well. Oh, God had used him in a mighty way. But you know what? That's the epitaph of many, many men and women in our history. They started so well. That's how we'll say it. And we usually follow that with bless their heart. (laughs) Started so well, but don't finish well. I want to contrast with you just for a few moments tonight on the difference between when we seek God and when we don't. Now it's very evident today in chapter 16 that Asa did not seek God in this particular battle. But he did before. And I want us to look at that. There's two battles that we see. Battle number one was in chapter 14 in verses 9 through 15. The first battle was with Zerah the Cushite or the Ethiopian, and he marched out against him with a vast army. So the enemy was the Ethiopians or the Cushites. But in battle number two, it was his kinfolk. It wasn't a strange foreigners coming into his country to attack him. It was his own people. It was the kinfolk. The second thing I want you to see is that the, the Cushite, the Ethiopian army, they marched out against him. They faced him face to face. But that's not what happened when Basha infiltrated Judah. He went to a little town, set up a secure a fortress so that nobody could leave or enter Judah or Israel. And in the first battle, you can see that Asa confronted the enemy. The Bible says that that verse 10 of chapter 14, that Asa went out to meet him. He was overwhelmed, uh, at least two to one odds. 
in battle, but he went out and confronted him. He went and looked him face to face and confronted him. That's when he was seeking the Lord. But when he wasn't seeking God, when he wasn't walking with God and being obedient, he didn't go and face Basha. He contacted his enemy, the king of Syria, and said, hey, I got a problem. I'll tell you what, I'll pay you more money than the treaty you've got with Israel for you to go and attack Israel. In a sense, it was a coward's way of handling it. Instead of going and talking to Basha himself, looking at him face to face, he hired somebody. I got a problem, go take care of it for me. When he was walking with God, Asa looked to the Lord for help. In, in verse 11 of chapter 14, Asa called the Lord his God and said, Lord, there is no one like you to help the powerless against the mighty. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rely on you. I'm looking to you. I'm relying on you. I can't face this enemy on my own. But when he wasn't walking close with the Lord, when he wasn't depending upon God, the prophet said, you relied on the king in verse 7 of chapter 16. You relied on the king of Syria, not on the Lord. He became dependent on someone else. When he was walking with God, the Lord fought for him. When he sought the Lord and when he depended upon God to win the battle, the Lord fought for him. The Bible says in verse 12 of 14, the Lord struck down the Cushites before Asa and Judah, and they fled. The Lord won the battle. But when he wasn't seeking the Lord, he had to bribe someone for help. As I mentioned to you this morning, you can buy man's power but you must seek God's power. Man's power can be bought. God's power must be sought. When in the first battle, when Asa was seeking the, God, uh, seeking the Lord for help, walking with God, Asa was encouraged by the prophet. When he came back from battle, the prophet met him on the way and said, hey, don't quit what you're doing. The Bible says in, in chapter 15 that the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, son of Oded. He went out to meet him. And the Bible says in the end, when he heard these words in verse 8, when he heard the words of the prophet, he took courage. He was encouraged. It, it gave him strength to go and continue the work that, that he was called to do. But when he wasn't walking with the Lord, when he returned well, he didn't go anywhere, actually. He didn't, he didn't go to battle. He sent somebody to do it for him. The prophet came to see him and said, you've done a foolish thing. You've done a foolish thing. When he was seeking God and they went off to war, they carried off large amounts of plunder. Matter of fact, in chapter 14, and in verse 14, they destroyed all the villages around Gerar for the terror of the Lord had fallen upon them. They plundered all these villages since there was much spoil there. They plundered all of them. But when he wasn't seeking God, he lost the chance to even possibly reunite the kingdom. When the, when the prophet said to him, the army of the king of Aram has escaped from your hand. When it, in my mind, it should have said, the king of Basha, I mean, the Basha, the king of Israel has escaped from your hand, but he didn't. He said, the king of Syria has escaped from your hand. God could have given him multiple victories if he had sought him, if he had leaned on him, but he didn't. And I'll tell you the one that really gets me is in chapter 15, you see Asa calling the people together. God has wrought a great victory. He's brought them together. I believe they're experiencing revival among them. They're seeking the, God, seeking the Lord. And he said, he, he called them all together and said, let's make a covenant between us and God that we're going to seek him with all our heart, with all our mind. We're going to seek God wholeheartedly. They were unified. They came together in unity to seek the Lord. But when Asa wasn't walking with God, it says that in the last part of verse 10, after he threw the, 
the prophet in prison, he says at the same time, Asa brutally oppressed some of the people. What a change. What a difference between seemingly a compassionate king who's seeking God and calling a nation back to the Lord to one here who's throwing prophets in prison and oppressing his people. What a change. When he was seeking God, the Bible teaches that God gave him rest, gave him peace and rest. Verse 19 of chapter 15 says, There was no more war until the 35th year of Asa's reign. But when Asa turned away from God and did not seek him, the prophet said, You've done a foolish thing. In chapter 16 and verse 9, You've done a foolish thing, and from now on you will be at war. For the rest of your days as king, you're going to be at war because he didn't trust the Lord. When he was seeking God, when he was, his heart was committed to the Lord, the Bible says there in verse 17 that although he did not remove the high places from Israel, Asa's heart was fully committed to the Lord all his life. But then in the end, he says that even in his illness, Even in his sickness, he wouldn't seek God. He only sought the doctors. And you see, I I seek the doctors time to time. A few months ago, we had the swine flu in my house. And I sought the doctor because I was hurting. And me and pain do not get along real well. My wife, bless her heart, she's had some illnesses and some health issues, and she's had times of chronic pain, and she handles it so well she keeps on functioning. My fever shoots up, I get a headache, I'm in bed. But I'm going to tell you, even while I was seeking the doctor for help, I was calling on God. Lord, touch me. Bring healing to me. But even in his sickness, he wouldn't turn to God. I'm just going to share a little bit of my heart, church. When I leave this world, when I draw my final breath, I want my latter days to be better than my former. I want to go out seeking the Lord. I want to go out living by faith and being able to testify until my last day what God has done for me. I want to go out with my last days telling you how God has come through for me, how I trusted him, how he answered my prayers, how he touched me, how he rescued me. I don't want on my deathbed to be telling you what God did for me 30 years ago. I want to be able to tell you a fresh encounter with a holy God who longs to meet with you every single day and draw you closer draw you deeper. I want my children to stand over my grave site and say my father loved God and served him until he drawed his last breath. If they can't say anything else about me, I want them to say he was faithful to our God and he was faithful to our mother. He was faithful. I don't want to have started well and did not finish. I tell you what, I love the words of Paul. I have kept the faith. I have finished my course. He had been faithful. And I know it's a danger as we get older and older, especially as we see the the things happening in this world, in this country that are going on even today. It's it's a thing to say to ourselves, It's getting scary out there. Somebody said said to me the other night, I think it was Saturday night at the Awana Appreciation Dinner, they said, hey, did you get one of those coupons for a gallon of gas? I said, no. They handed me a $5 bill. (laughs) I took it. I'm not turning down a gallon of gas. (laughs) But I'm going to tell you something. As the days for Jesus to come back draw nearer, it's not going to get better. 
And I'm convinced of this, church. It doesn't matter who you put in the White House. It doesn't matter whether you like him or not. The closer it gets for Jesus to return, it's not going to get a lot better on this earth. Matter of fact, it's going to get a lot worse. But I want us to join together in our hearts and our minds today and say, you know what? No matter how bad it gets on this earth, the Bible has promised that God would never leave us nor forsake us, that he would always be with us. And David, as I said this morning, David said he was young and he was old, but he'd never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. I'm here to tell you today, I've been through some rough times, folks. I have eaten a homemade bread made out of a coffee can day after day because we couldn't buy anything but, but bread and beans. I've been broke. I have been in prayer meetings with my parents when we had nothing. And I'm not talking about we had food in the freezer we didn't want to eat. I'm saying there was zero in the house. And we got down on our knees before God and said, Lord, you promised to meet every need according to your riches and glory. And before we could say amen, somebody was knocking at the door. And we opened the door and there's sacks of groceries at the front door. I'm not exaggerating to you tonight. God meets the needs of his people. Even recently in my own life, I was struggling because... I kept trying to help God meet a need in my own life. I spent two, two and a half weeks trying my best to help God. And the more I tried to help, the less help I was getting, and the more frustrated I became. Finally to the point that I I was talking to my brother Nathan, and I was just sharing with him one day my frustration. And he said to me, if you don't mind, I'd like to use something you've said. You know, it's a bean thing when somebody takes your own words and uses them against you. (laughs) He said, you have have preached from the pulpit that you should find out what God wants and do that. What was I going to (laughs) say? But you know what? It hit home. And all afternoon, those words kept piercing my heart. Do you you believe what you stand up here and say? Or does it just sound good from the pulpit? I had to determine in my heart, I believe what I say. I believe what the Word of God teaches. And Monday morning, I'm going to tell you, I was on my face before God saying, Lord, I am sorry. I haven't trusted you in this matter. I haven't sought you. Well, I've sought you, but I didn't want to hear what you had to say. I'm trying to help you get it done. But today, I repent and I quit. I'm not going to help you anymore. Because I ain't been a bit of help anyway. So I leave it at your feet. I I stop trying to help you. And I'm waiting on you to do it. We had some meetings that day in Harlingen. And all day long, I would think about it. And I'd say, Lord, I'm asking you to fix it. And I'm asking you to fix it today. Today. And somebody, I was telling somebody the story, and they said, were you demanding God? Oh, no, no, I was begging God. I wasn't demanding nothing. I was pleading with him, Lord, I need you to answer, and I'm asking you to answer me today. And I want to tell you, I had no sooner got home than my phone rang, and the answer came. When I quit trying to help God and just said, I'm going to trust you, the answer arrived. I want to leave this world, church, knowing that I had been faithful. And I trusted him to the very end. And just because things didn't look good, or just because I was starting to get older, I don't want to quit trusting the Lord and start trying to depend upon my own way of fixing something. A faith that fizzles before the finish is faulty from the first. I've made up my mind, church. I'm not going back. I'm going to walk with him. I'm going to trust him. And I won't own, if anything you can said of me on my tombstone, he was faithful. He trusted his God. Let's stand together, every head bowed and every eye closed. 
just for a few moments, why don't we just join our hearts together and say to our God, Lord, we're going to trust you. We're going to walk with you. We're going to seek you. No matter what it looks like, no matter the, the storm we may face, no matter the trials we may go through, persecution may come, God, I'll trust you. Hard times may come, Lord, I'm going to trust you. Good times may come, Lord, I'm going to stay focused on you and I'm going to trust you. Father, we thank you for our time together tonight. I thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray you speak to our hearts as only you can. May we just choose to be obedient tonight. Just choose to trust you, have faith in you. Lord, you've said in your word that without faith, it's impossible to please you. So I just declare in my heart tonight, God, I'm going to trust you. I thank you that you have always been faithful. When I wasn't faithful, you remain faithful. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. As they begin to play and sing, the altars are open. Brother Morgan, Brother Nathan, and myself are here. If you need to speak with us, or if you just want to come and pray, you're welcome to come. I'd rather